Hello everyone. Welcome to KubeCon Virtual. And today we are going to talk on 34 truths about Kubernetes and Edge. My name is Sayam Patak and I'm a software engineer working at Walmart Labs. My Twitter handler is Sayam Patak. I'm CKA, CKAD certified. I'm a CNCF ambassador. I'm Docker community leader. I run a lot of meetup groups, including Rancher, Influx, Docker, at Bangalore, I'm an influx ace, and I also run a YouTube channel where I do a lot of live streams with other community members. Today I'm joined with Karthik. Thanks, Siam. Uh, my name is Karthik Gaikwad, and I'm the head of cloud native engineering at Verica. Um, I'm the author of Learning Kubernetes and a bunch of other uh, cloud native courses on LinkedIn Learning. Uh, part of Verica. Uh, I built the or Oracle managed Kubernetes engine and was a principal developer at Oracle Cloud. Um, I also do, do a bunch of community stuff like DevOps Days Austin, Cloud Austin, All Day DevOps, and Container Days. I've been in industry for a while, and you can find me more on uh, Iteration One on Twitter. Today, we'll go into more about edge computing and talk about the intersection of edge and Kubernetes. We'll discuss some of the complexities that we see from an edge perspective um, and how Kubernetes and K3S helps us from that perspective. We'll talk more about Cloud Native at Edge, uh, do a really sweet demo about how to run K3S on a Raspberry Pi cluster, talk more about complexities at Edge, and then give you some recommendations. So what is edge computing? If you look at Wikipedia, it describes edge computing as a distributed computing paradigm that brings computation and data storage closer to the location where it's needed to improve response time and save bandwidth. And also, if you look at edge computing, there's a lot of growth. From the Gartner and Forrester reviews, Gartner said that by 2023, there could be more than 20 times as many smart devices on the edge of the network as in conventional IT roles. Forrester actually said that the edge cloud market will grow at least by 50%. But what does this all really mean? Being an engineer, I like to break this problem down by looking at specific use cases. In my time at National Instruments and Mentor Embedded, I spent a lot of time looking at the intersection between the cloud and edge devices or embedded devices in general. One of the, my favorite things that used to come up a lot of times was how do we get all this stuff to work in the case of wind turbines? So we'll take that as a use case. So from a turbine perspective, from an individual wind turbine, you want to do a bunch of calculations. So in this case, a uh, turbine might want to calculate the wind or blade speed, the efficiency of each blade, how much power it's consuming, and what the tur operating temperature might be. From a control perspective, you might want to understand what the generator speed is, try and increase it or decrease it, look at the blade adjustment angle. So the blade adjustment angle, the turbines can actually move in a more in a horizontal or a vertical way. And there are times when you actually wanna change that angle to be able to generate more electricity. And also the wind turbine rotation. So you can actually rotate the turbine left to right. Um, and you know there are times when you might wanna do that too because the wind direction might be from a different kind of perspective. So those are diff different controls that you might have from a turbine standpoint. From a wind farm control center, so the control center is more of a place where you might have a lot of folks kind of looking at your whole turbine farm uh, from a holistic perspective. So I, I threw in a picture here, uh, Iberdrola Renewables control, control Room. And from, from that perspective, you're kind of looking at the whole farm. So you, know, you might be collecting your average turbine speeds in there, looking at the health status of uh, each of your individual turbines, uh, monitoring performance of the turbines. You know, if, there's, if there are things that might not be working with an individual turbine, you might need to send a technician out and go get that fixed, et cetera. Um, also monitor the general efficiency of the farm. Is it actually generating a lot of electricity or you know, is there something wrong from like a farm perspective? And then also uh, one of the big goals is to be able to generate electricity. So you know, be able to calculate that from a whole farm perspective. So if you kind of look at this from like an architecture, from a really, really high level architecture standpoint, uh, from the cloud level, you have uh, the cloud is responsible, you can think of this more of a, um, for, you know, from the high level, from the control center perspective. So it's responsible for the overall operations of the farm, you know, big data processing. So you have a bunch of data coming in 
to your to your wind farm, you might want to throw that into the cloud to do additional processing, um, aggregate different data, et cetera, across, uh, you know, a lot of times that um, you might want to use the cloud if you have multiple farms, uh, you want to do more data aggregation across your farms. From an individual farm level uh, or from your, you know, control center at a specific farm, uh, that is more responsible for the individual farm. So all the turbines in there, uh, it's connected to the internet. So if you have to send data up to uh, the cloud, you're able to do that. Uh, and also connected to all the turbines in the farm as well. Uh, typical use case uh, that I've seen over here is uh, the turbines are connected via ethernet um, or you know some other, some, some other kind of way, but ethernet is pretty popular these days. Um, and then going down to the sensor level or to the turbine level, the turbine itself, you know, you can think of it more like an individual IoT sensor or an IoT device. Um, so in this case for the turbine, it's responsible for electricity generation, you know, in a safe manner um, and also efficient operations and data collection at an individual turbine level. So what are some typical edge issues that we've seen? Uh, from an edge perspective, uh, and from a device perspective, uh, typical issues are, you know, battery, there's a lack of processing power. So if you want to run, you know, heavyweight calculations, et cetera, you're just not able to do that. The code deployments need to be tiny because there's not a lot of RAM and memory on the actual board. Um, and then you also have, you know, embedded device concerns. So like you can't actually put something too big on there or, you know, other concerns that we might not think about from, uh, you know, from a cloud perspective. At the edge level, it's all about connectivity. So, you know, is everything connected up? Uh, is it easy to connect uh, multiple devices to the edge? Uh, is it easy to connect um, your control center back to internet? Uh, I put communicate with cloud over here. So your communication line to, uh, to the internet needs to be pretty good. Um, and then have enough processing power to run complex calculations. Um, typically, this is not a problem. But this used to be a problem back in the day when you had to build out like your own kind of data center inside of, um, you know, inside of your control plane or your control tower. Um, and then as well as maintenance of your sensors and farm, this doesn't happen super often, but it does like your sensors might go offline. There might be issues with individual turbines, et cetera. Uh, and then you need to go and address maintenance issues um, of your sensors. So that's, that's something that happens quite a lot on the edge level. So where does Kubernetes uh, fit in all of here? Um, one of the things about uh, this whole ecosystem is that there's actually a lot of vendors, uh, but they're very like vendor specific. And then you have walk in to your, um, you know, to your IoT devices or to your edge devices. So there's a ton of custom solution providers. So you know you might uh, approach a specific provider about, hey, I need like a solution for my wind farm. Like what do you have to provide? And you can go talk to individual vendors that'll help you kind of. Um, you know, build and maintain all of these solutions for your whole wind farm. The one really nice thing about Kubernetes and one of the reasons it's caught on uh, really well in the cloud computing market is that it's based on an open source ecosystem. So uh, you can have open source uh, kind of in the cloud. You can also have open source, uh, you know, on the edge side of things. And it's the greatest thing about Kubernetes is that it's built for managing many devices. So things like scaling and deployment, et cetera, uh, all of those things are you know, uh, are ingrained in the in the Kubernetes mindset and in the Kubernetes ecosystem. So, if you look at Kubernetes distributions specifically built for Edge, there's two two really popular kinds for this right now. There's uh, Kube Edge and there's K3S. In this presentation, we'll talk more about K3S. Um, and with that, I will hand it back over to Siam. So that was a great introduction by Karthik on Kubernetes and Edge. Why Kubernetes for Edge and what exactly is Edge? Let's now understand what actually the problem is that we as engineers are trying to solve. So we have Edge and we want to leverage the highly complex ecosystem of Kubernetes at Edge. Now, in order to do that, we have K3S, which we are going to discuss today. So K3S is another open source CNCF certified Kubernetes distribution, which has all the powers of Kubernetes and it is extremely suitable for Edge. So as you can see, it's extremely lightweight. And by lightweight, when I say, it means it is less than a 50 MB binary. So which is huge. So it removes all the entry cloud providers, it removes all the entry storage drivers, and it removes all the alpha features. So it's basically a very trimmed down code-based version of the native Kubernetes distribution. 
it's specifically built for arm so when the developers were building kubernetes so there were two things first like we have to make something for the edge for the arm devices second it should not only be for the developer environment it should be focused for production yes you can definitely use it for developer developer scenarios but it is readily built for production and it is good for all the production ready scenarios it has full power of kubernetes so when we say that the code base is trim so the power of kubernetes reduces no it's not the case so the code base is reduced but still you get the full power of kubernetes and most importantly everything is running as a single process so which is what makes it so simple efficient and fast let's quickly dive into the architecture of k3s so on the left hand side you have the k3s server and you, on the right you have the k3s agent now everything is running as a single process so it's typically the same architecture as you have of a kubernetes one but here what additional thing is the tunnel proxy so the agent registers itself to the server via a tunnel proxy and once the connection is established after that the communication happens via this particular tunnel between the agent and the server rest it has the escalate database which is inside the process itself and its cd is not used in the back end they're using kind and it's a pluggable kind of architecture so if you want to ha architecture for k3s you go for uh, you can go for mysql you can go for postgres and also it has container d inbuilt so you don't have docker you don't have to install anything so it has the con uh, container d inbuilt it has the traffic as an ingress controller as well which helps you give the load balancing capabilities so that's a high level architecture for k3s so today what we are going to demo is we will be measuring the cpu temperature of raspberry pis which are running a k3s kubernetes cluster so we are having two raspberry pis and we'll be installing k3s on top of that we'll be deploying a daemon set a deployment as a service for influx a deployment as a service for grafana in the daemon set what we'll be using is we'll be scraping the temperature of raspberry pi sending it to influx then visualizing the graphs from grafana so let's go it's demo time so in this particular demo first we'll install k3s on raspberry pis so i already have two raspberry pis connected so let's log in to both the devices so let's log in here i'll enter my super secret password let's log into the another instance yes i'm logged in to both the instances so now the raspberry pi will be working as the k3s server and the raspberry pi agent will be the agent which will connect to the server now k3s installation as i have mentioned before as well it's pretty simple so it's as simple as one command that's it so it's finding the stable release it's using v1.18.6 and it's downloading the binaries and within a couple of seconds your k3s server will be up and running awesome k3s has been successfully installed now in order to check that we'll just do k3s kubectl get nodes yeah our master node is up but it's not ready let's do it once again so k3s kubectl get nodes our master node is ready up and running with kubernetes version v1.18.6 now let's grab the token so now we are going to install the k3s agent on the raspberry pi agent so for that we have to give the k3s url which is the server url which is https and 2.168.1.129.6443 then we give the k3s token
and it finds the stable release and downloads the version and then install the k3s agent so siam while this is running i have a question for you would we essentially run yeah. this command if we were running this on multiple agents yes gotcha looks really easy then so basically if you have uh, multiple agents you just have to run this command and it's done <clears throat> so that's it the k3s agent has also started now you can check the service or you can directly go to the server one and do a k3s kubectl get nodes and what we see over here is magically in matter of minutes we have our k3s server and the k3s agent up and running now we do not need this window so let's move over to the code which we are going to deploy today so this is the github repository which is available so as shown in the demo diagram so what we are going to do is we are going to have running a daemon set So we are going to deploy these three files, which is a daemon set, a Grafana YAML, and an influx YAML. So in the daemon set, we just have an image, and I will walk you through the code. So daemon set is something which runs on all the nodes. So the Grafana is having a deployment and a service, and it is using Grafana Docker image with a container port 3000. Similarly for influx, we have a deployment for influx, influx 1.7, and we have port 8086, and we have exposed the service as a node port. Now what exactly the code is doing? So we are taking the influx DB client we are establishing the client. We are creating the database. We are switching to that database. We are having a timestamp. Now this particular file gives you the temperature, the CPU temperature updated all times. And we create a JSON body where we send all the tags and the fields. Then we write the JSON body to influx. And this code is running every five seconds. So this is what the code is. So now let's clone the repository and deploy all the files. So let's do a git clone. And the clone is already done. So we cd into the folder. We do a ls and we do a k3s kubectl apply of the deploy. So all the YAML files should be deployed so it is create it has created the daemon set it has created the deployment and the service for grafana it has created the deployment and the service for influx and now if we see k3s kubectl get pods we can see all the pods are in running state so let's quickly see the services So our Grafana is running on 31712. So let's go back and open Grafana UI. So we are we have our Grafana loading. So we we'll quickly put the username, password, we skip it. So we have our Grafana. Let's quickly add the data source. So since we have influx, so we'll choose influx, which is a native data source in Grafana. We'll put the URL. And we have created KubeCon as a database. We'll save and test and data source is working. Now let's go ahead and create a dashboard, add new panel. 
we select the measurement which is temp we select the value which is the temperature and we add a tag which is the system and let's do some filtering with the bars and let's expand this particular area more so that we have some data and you can see we have the temperature coming from raspberry pi which is a server and the raspberry pi agent which is the agent and for both we are having the temperature 74 degrees and we have 78 79 degrees over here so for all we are getting all the metrics we everything is getting captured and on top of it we can create some alerts so if the temperature goes above maybe 80 percent so you get an alert and you can have different notifications so this is just one use case where what we have seen is we have our temperature sensing from a raspberry pi now this particular use case can be extended to n number of sensors like karthik has talked for windmill where temperature is an essential part and can be extended to other sensors and have uh, all things in place so you have one stable thing ready and now you can add top of on top of it you can add different sensing and get all the data and do machine learning on top of it statistical analysis on top of it and get uh, valuable insights and forecasting so that's it for today's demo hope you like it back to you karthik cool thanks i that was awesome um not a lot of times do demos actually work the first time and so you know this is pretty cool um okay i'm going to share my screen again All right, so in our demo, Sam talked through how things actually worked um, on the K3S cluster that we had created. Uh, let's look at a couple of challenges uh, that we've seen from an edge computing standpoint, uh, and then we'll you know, open up for questions uh, at the end of this talk. So from a, from a challenges perspective and from a future perspective, you, know, you have uh, one of the, the biggest thing in this whole sector is the idea of vendor lock-in. So that's the value premise of using Kubernetes uh, at edge solutions, you know, kind of like K3S or uh, Cube Edge uh, as well. Uh, one thing that we still have some more work to do, I think, from a Kubernetes at edge perspective is more hardware integration. So you saw that it was pretty seamless to work with Raspberry Pi, but what about for specific IoT devices that you might have, um, you know, you might be building um, and, um, you know, building and testing out your specific uh, edge edge devices or your IoT devices, uh, you, there might be work or some uh, missing things that you might have to do from a K3S or Cube Edge perspective. The biggest thing here also is uh, cultural challenges, um, and you know we've kind of seen this uh, as well with just back end developers and front end developers, but also um, the folks actually working on the IoT side, uh, those are embedded developers, and their mindset is very different from kind of what we think about from a cloud native perspective or from a cloud native developer perspective. So it's a different tech stack. Uh, C is very common uh, from that tech stack over there. So, and then also uh, for, for us uh, in the cloud native world, uh, things like CI and CD, continuous integration, continuous deployment delivery, those things are, are very normal. And you know, those are things that we think are about up front. But from an embedded developer standpoint, they might not even know what CI or CD might be. So there, there are challenges that you'll end up facing uh, there when you kind of bring two disparate sets of developers together. Um, also, understanding your architectural needs. So you know, we kind of talked about Raspberry Pi and how to run K3S on Raspberry Pi. We also talked about the wind farm example. So you know, from a, if you take like a thirty thousand foot view on this. Kubernetes is really good for cloud uh, for cloud and data center uh, compute instances. So you're managing your whole data center with Kubernetes. Uh, that's why it's really popular. Uh, Cube Edge from our reading is really good for, you know, uh, when you want to have a cloud control plane and you want to have disparate edge devices or instances, uh, it's great for controlling that. So think of the, you know, if you're using uh, Nest kind of devices, et cetera, where they're all able to connect to uh, the cloud or to a cloud control plane, Cube Edge would work really well over there. K3S is also really good for the cloud use cases and edge as well, uh, as well for air gap environments. So in the scenario where you have a wind farm and you know your actual turbines don't have access to the internet, but they're still connected up to a local network, uh, it would work pretty well in those uh, environments as well where you have more kind of air gap kind of scenarios. 
Well, thank you, Karthik. Now let's dive into the future discussion on the state of Kubernetes and Edge. So let's make it a informal discussion and mm -hmm. not a very formal PowerPoint kind of discussion. Yep. So I think that Kubernetes will play a very important role for Edge. Why? Because people and the companies are transitioning into the virtualization world and building apps for cloud native ecosystem and they want to uh, change the apps, change the versions, all that stuff. And Kubernetes will definitely play a very important role in handling these operations. Uh, speaking about K3S, as we have already spoken, like K3S is extremely lightweight and it gives you the full power of Kubernetes at edge. So it becomes extremely important that we should know where K3S stands from a future point of view. Uh, since the uh, Rancher acquisition by SUSE, so we have seen that there have been questions around like how this K3S product will be going on, but it has been made very clear by the leadership from Rancher itself that K3S will be their go forward product and it will remain open source and people will keep on contributing uh, to K3S. Now, if you go by the stats, uh, I see that it has more than 13,000 GitHub stars, which is pretty amazing. Uh, it has a wide community adoption and people actually love it. So that's why they have built products on top of K3S. So if you see uh, open source enthusiasts like Alex, uh, he built a K3S up, which is pronounced as Ketchup for, uh, so it's basically bootstrapping the K3S cluster in less than a minute. So, so that's, that's the adoption that we have. Then there are a few companies like Sivo, uh, who is who built up the first ever managed K3S uh, service. So, so people have already started looking K3S as a stable product. And it is always in line with the upstream Kubernetes uh, updates. So whenever the version, a new version comes, so K3S team and the open source folks, they work and make it, uh, you know, matching the upstream Kubernetes version. So I think, yes, uh, K3S itself has a very bright future and uh, people are making, they have their roadmaps very clear uh, and uh, the issues, the pull requests say it all. Uh, so K3S definitely has a bright future. And with this, uh, definitely it will be used for edge because that was a primary use case for K3S. So edge computing will definitely be very uh, powerful, become very powerful with the usage of K3S. So uh, with that, what do you think, Karthik, uh, like where does the future stand from Kubernetes and Edge perspective? I totally agree with you. Um, I was kind of trying to think about whether, um, you know, to kind of go deeper into the technology or think of it from a high level perspective. Um, and I think from, a, you know, from a high level perspective, from a tech standpoint, I think we're, we're there today. Uh, what, you know, whether it's K3S, whether it's Cube Edge, I think the idea of using uh, something like Kubernetes that helps you, uh, that basically helps you uh, take, you know, a single device, put basically an operating system on there and then scale that for, you know, hundreds um, like nodes of many clusters. Um, I think that it's pr pretty proven technology today from a K3S standpoint, from a Kube standpoint. Um, so I think we have solutions, which is great. Um, I would mentioned before that the, the challenge I think that we will face, at least in this next year, next couple of years, is to understand what the problems are, understand what the real problems are from an embedded developer standpoint. So a lot of it, you know, comes from like uh, bridging communities, right? Because I think the communities that we have from a tech standpoint, like you and I, we're squarely in like the cloud native space. And we're like, yeah, Kubernetes we understand it, at least we might not know everything about it, but I think we know like uh, from like a pretty good uh, perspective of like how the, how everything works, architectural, architectural uh, implementation, whatever. But I don't think anybody in the embedded space uh, really knows about uh, a lot of the stuff that, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of coming out with, whether it's K3S, whether it's KubeEdge, whether it's just even Kubernetes or Prometheus or uh, like any of the things in our ecosystem. So uh, the, the, the challenge will be, uh, you know, advocating a lot of these platforms to folks that are actually writing embedded code and being like, hey, uh, I know you're trying to solve these MQTT problems and you're trying to write this, this uh, MQTT code uh, specifically for your uh, But did you know there's like a, a tool that you can use to, or not, not tool, but a platform that you can use to kind of manage all of this stuff uh, by default um, and, you know, kind of get, get some kind of reception from what, 
um, you know, what, what folks who are actually in that ecosystem um, have. So understand, you know, kind of understanding their pain points and then bringing it back um, and then, you know, building on the, the next generation of what K3S or Edge is going to become. Uh, and I think we will probably end up finding things that we might have missed uh, from a first pass, whether it's, hey, we need, you know, uh, it's great that it works with uh, REST APIs, but really uh, we need all the communication to work with, uh, you know, MQTT, or, you know, we need something even more low power like Bluetooth or something like that. Uh, and we have to write, you know, uh, more more APIs that help communicate, uh, you know, through a cluster with with Bluetooth or something 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 similar to that. So, um, you know, it might sound kind of lofty, but it's trying to figure out how we can bring uh, embedded engineers that are kind of in their own ecosystem, might be in their own silo, but try and bring them into kind of our cloud native tribe. Um, and I think that's where like the next generation of problems for us will be. Uh, it's it's not necessarily like technology, but it'll you know it'll end up being more of like hey we're we we built we built this huge community of folks that are uh, you know that are cloud native that understand how uh, you know to deploy and run applications in the cloud, but now we're trying to extend that away uh, extend that into the uh, ecosystem of you know embedded as well. So that's kind of where I think we'll at least for the next couple of years we'll go. Um, because I feel like we have something pretty good uh, in our space, uh, and you know, let's let's take it forward and figure out what we can actually do with it. Yeah, I completely agree to all those points, Karthik. And even even I feel like uh, you know the use case is like uh, people want to do machine learning at edge, uh, like capturing billions of images and not sending them to cloud uh, due to latency issues and all that. So so they need solutions which can be. Uh, fit into their specific small data centers and they can do uh, you know a machine learning on top of that anomaly detection on top of that whether you take example of a uh, few generators and finding the defects from that or you take example of uh, the cctv footages and you know uh, doing the capturing the per second images and doing ml uh, ai on top of that so yes the there's a huge need for the cloud native uh, ecosystem over there and uh, uh, the engineers who are building these devices they need to understand uh, like these might be the challenges and this might be the right hardware to create uh, even so that that particular uh, portion fits well with the cloud native tech stack that we have today it sounds like it sounds like we're um, if folks can you know come up with like good reference architectures for what everybody else is doing then we might actually be able to do some cool things in this space too yeah Totally agree. Hmm. Awesome. Well, um, Sam, do you have any? Um, I think we're probably almost close to time. Uh, do you any uh, last last minute thoughts that you have before we close down? Uh, no, I, I think like uh, we we did a, a small demo today, so I would like I would encourage all the attendees to go back and try something out and let us know. Uh, like what you you feel about Kubernetes and Edge, and what you are trying to do with your home labs, and or even at uh, at your organizations, and uh, we'll be happy to hear and happy to help uh, to the best of our knowledge. Yep, uh, totally agree. And uh, once again, you can read Siam on on Twitter at uh, Siam Patak, uh, and I'm Iteration One on Twitter. Um, I think we're uh, probably at the end of our session, so you know we'll be around uh, if you have questions for us. Uh, use uh, you know use use this use the Slack or we're actually both on uh, the Kubernetes Slack as well so you can uh, you know you can ping there uh, there as well but uh, we'll hang out after after a session so you know we're we're not hard to find so um, hope hope this was useful uh, for y'all and uh, thank you for attending our talk yeah thank you all bye bye all right take it easy y'all. <laughs>